On the left is a free-living single-celled organism known as a coanoflagellate. On the right is a cross-section through a sponge showing the feeding cells, or coanocytes, that line the inner cavity. Both cells feed by generating water currents with their flagella. This allows them to capture bacteria on their collar of microvilli where they consume them. If you think these cells resemble one another, you're not alone. For over 150 years, this uncanny similarity has been recognized by biologists and has been the cornerstone in ideas regarding the origin of multicellular animals. The hypothesis states that free-living coanoflagellates evolved into colonial coanoflagellates. Cells in the coanoflagellate colonies then evolved specialized functions, eventually giving rise to the most ancestral multicellular animal life known, the sponge. But just because animals look similar doesn't mean they evolved from one another. How do we know the free-living coanoflagellates aren't de-evolved from multicellular sponges? And true multicellular animals contain a myriad of proteins that hold their cells together, allowing neighboring cells to communicate. It seems impossible to make a multicellular organism without these proteins, but why would they evolve if the organism wasn't multicellular to begin with? This is another example of an irreducibly complex chicken and egg problem. Let's take a look at what the mountain of evidence collected by scientists over the past century has to say about the origin of multicellular life. Some of the articles used in the production of this video can be downloaded from a link in the video description. In this video, I will answer the following four questions. 1. Which came first, the free-living coanoflagellate or the sponge coanocyte? 2. Where did all the cell adhesion and cell-cell signaling proteins come from? 3. Are there species that transition between single and multicellular forms living today? And four, has anyone ever witnessed a single-celled organism evolving into a multicellular one? So question one, which came first, the free-living coanoflagellate or the sponge coanocyte? Using modern DNA sequencing, scientists have been able to construct a phylogenetic tree based on the entire genome sequence of multiple organisms. The shape of the tree is based solely on statistical analysis of the DNA sequence, nothing else, no bias, no experiment or influence. What we find is the following. The coanoflagellates form a single group just outside the multicellular animals. So coanoflagellates are the closest ancestor to modern multicellular animals. Coanoflagellates therefore did not de-evolve from sponge coanocytes. Question two. If multicellular animals evolved from coanoflagellates, where did all the cell adhesion and cell-cell signaling proteins come from? Recently, the genome of a coanoflagellate was sequenced, revealing some amazing contents. Modern multicellular organisms use a range of protein domains to facilitate cell adhesion and cell-cell communication. These include cadherins, integrins, lectins, immunoglobulin, and collagen domains. It turns out the genome of the free-living single-celled coanoflagellate contains dozens of proteins with cadherin, integrin, lectin, immunoglobulin, and collagen domains, shown here in magenta. So what is a single-celled organism doing with the building blocks for a multicellular organism? I'm not afraid to say, we don't know. Ongoing experiments are testing various hypotheses for their function, including adhesion to rocks, capturing prey, or maintaining the collar of microvilli they use for feeding. The difference between the cadherins, integrins, and immunoglobulin proteins used by multicellular animals and those by the single-celled coanoflagellates is extremely small. All it would take are a few point mutations to turn a single-celled coanoflagellate into a true multicellular animal, another example of how evolution made use of pre-existing genes for novel functions. Question 3. Are there living species that transition between single and multicellular forms? Yes. There is one species of coanoflagellate that upon sensing a particular bacteria in its environment, transitions from unicellular to multicellular and does so in a very interesting way. When it divides, the cell division is halted just before it finishes. This keeps the cells attached by a small cytoplasmic bridge. So rather than growing by clumping, this organism grows from a single cell by keeping daughter cells attached, thus making it a true multicellular organism. Question 4. Has anyone ever witnessed a single-celled organism evolving into a multicellular organism? Yes. From 1974 to 1996, the Boras and Boxhorn labs maintained a culture of cholera vulgaris, a single-celled algae. 
Never in the 22 years since the culture was first stocked did anyone ever witness anything other than single-celled algae in the tank. One day in 1996, the lab decided to test the evolutionary effects of introducing a predator into the tank. The predator, Acromonas valacea, is a single-celled organism that eats the algae by engulfing it through its oral pore. To no one's surprise, when the predator was added, the population of algae quickly dropped while the population of predator quickly rose. Eventually, the predators ran out of algae and began to starve, starting a massive die-off of predators. This relieved pressure on the algae, allowing its numbers to increase again. Anyone who took Biology 101 would recognize this as a classic predator-prey cycle. After two of these cycles, equivalent to 10 to 20 algae generations, something bizarre appeared in the tank. Large, multicellular strands of algae, too large to be engulfed by the predators, began to dominate the population. Over many tens of generations, these amorphous algae strands settled down on eight-celled forms. The multicellular algae grows by keeping cells attached following division, not by clumping, again making it a true multicellular organism. But all it took was slight modifications to the cell wall. Now we know this represents de novo evolution of a multicellular organism for four reasons. Reason one, the form took over a dozen generations to appear. If it were an innate trait the algae possessed to survive predation, they would have switched it on in the first generation. Reason two, the multicellular form refined itself over dozens of generations, indicating further evolution. The eight-celled ball is large enough that it can't be eaten, but not so large that cells are blocked from exchanging nutrients with the surrounding environment. An innate trait would have appeared in its final form. Reason three, when the multicellular form is placed on its own in the absence of predators, it is stable for as long as the scientists observed. If it were an innate defense response, it should eventually turn off, but it doesn't. Reason four. Because of reason three, if it were an innate trait, then it could never have been used in the entire history of this species of algae. During the history of this algae, mutations that would disrupt the gene responsible for the multicellular form would have been neutral and therefore not selected against. The chance of an unused gene not being mutated away over millions of generations is extremely small. So let's review. There exists a class of unicellular organisms that closely resemble one cell type of sponges. We know sponges didn't de-evolve into the coanoflagellates. And while sponges are the most ancestral multicellular animal, coanoflagellates are the group ancestral to them. Coanoflagellates contain all the protein domains used by multicellular organisms to hold cells together, and some coanoflagellates can transition between unicellular and multicellular forms. Finally, there is at least one observed case of a unicellular organism evolving into a multicellular one. A mutation in cell surface proteins, cell wall construction, or halting cell division just before it completes is all it takes for a unicellular organism to evolve into a multicellular one. We not only have beautiful examples of the transitional states, but can witness this evolution still happening today. The origin of multicellular organisms evolved a chance mutation in a pre-existing gene that allowed daughter cells to remain attached following cell division. This may have made the organism a more efficient predator or a more elusive prey. Either way, this beneficial mutation was passed on to future generations. It's equivalent to transforming a plastic block into a Lego, where simple changes in the arrangement of the building blocks can give rise to a diverse array of forms. Over time, further gene duplications and mutations expanded the palette of cell adhesion and cell-cell communication genes. The diversity of cell arrangements and cell types grew, giving rise to the diverse forms of multicellular life we see today.